On January 6, 2021, hundreds of Washingtonians serving as Metropolitan Police Department officers or Capitol Police officers and many others defended the Capitol with their bodies and their lives while out-of-state insurrectionists and coup plotters and cop haters descended on the Capitol to attack us. Washingtonians acted to save the very Congress in which they still have no voting representation at all. You talk about patriotism, that's patriotism. But if they didn't try to violently overthrow the government and install a dictator, what did they do that's gotten everyone in the majority so upset with them that they want to overturn their local laws for the first time in more than three decades? Well, it's simple. They exercised their rights under the First Amendment, the Ninth Amendment, and the Tenth Amendment by speaking, assembling, organizing a statehood constitutional convention, and then submitting a petition for redress of grievances and for admission as a state to the union. They did what 37 states have done successfully before them. They tried to get Congress to use our powers under Article 4 to end their second-class status and disenfranchisement by admitting them on an equal footing with the original 13 states. And this is apparently what has set the majority off. In the last two Congresses, in 2020 and 2021, the House voted to approve Washington's petition for admission to the Union as a state, bringing Washington that much closer to the plane of equality in the Union. D.C. statehood did not make it through the Senate in either case, but that provisional defeat for the people of Washington is apparently not enough for the new majority, which shrewdly understands that most statehood drives take many years and that D.C. statehood is picking up a lot of momentum. So the new majority has been constructed with votes of a, a lot of MAGA members, um, like Representative Green, uh, who told us in the Oversight Committee the other day that the major civil rights issue she sees in Washington today is the discriminatory mistreatment, not of Washingtonians, but of MAGA insurrectionists who are in jail for assaulting officers, interfering with a federal proceeding, and engaging in seditious conspiracy, which means conspiring to overthrow the government of the United States. The people of Washington are now apparently being forced to pay the price for stepping out of line and simply demanding equal rights. The majority wants to teach them a lesson for talking about statehood and opposing insurrection. And they want to turn the clock back on D.C.'s home rule power and relive the glory days when Washington was run like a colony by some racist Dixiecrats out of the House District Committee. Yes, that was my party in power then, and it was wrong then, and it's wrong now. Today, it's the GOP that's determined to put the people of Washington in their place. And make no mistake, it's not just these two laws that showed up today without any hearing at all, without any analysis by the committee. They will be attacking Washington not just for its local voting rights policies and criminal justice code, but for its gun safety policies, its defense of abortion rights and LGBTQ rights, its decriminalization of marijuana, and dozens of other issues potentially headed to the House floor if we really want to go down this road of becoming the super D.C. City Council. This is Jamie Raskin advocating for D.C. statehood while speaking at a congressional hearing regarding the role that Congress should have in overseeing D.C.'s laws. And just as a quick note on statehood for D.C., remember, we're talking about an area with 672,000 residents, which is more than the 647,000 residents of Vermont and more than the 581,000 residents of Wyoming. And not for nothing, but I don't think it's a coincidence that of those three places, the two that have white populations of over 90% have statehood, while the one with a 46% black population doesn't. And to further emphasize the point here, here's a clip of Jesse Waters from Fox News during the whole Balloon Gate episode, where he was trying to emphasize the fact that no one lives in these red states. Montana has no one living in Montana. Alaska, even less people. Not a great point if your argument is that DC isn't populated enough to have statehood. But then again, I'm not sure that Jesse Waters is known for great points. I should note that the House has twice passed a bill granting statehood for DC, which wasn't taken up by the Senate, but has prompted Republicans to line up against the effort regardless. And so now there's a whole gamut of excuses being thrown out by Republicans, which Mondaire Jones pointed out during the last debate on DC statehood in Congress. One Senate Republican said that DC wouldn't be a quote, well-rounded working class state. I had no idea there were so many syllables in the word white. One of my House Republican colleagues said that D.C. shouldn't be a state because the district doesn't have a landfill. <laughs> my goodness, with all the racist trash my colleagues have brought to this debate, I can see why they're worried about having a place to put it. 
the truth is there is no good faith argument for disenfranchising over 700,000 people, Mr. Speaker, most of whom are people of color. Uh, these desperate objections are about fear. Fear that in D.C. their white supremacist politics will no longer play. Fear that soon enough white supremacist politics won't work anywhere in America. Fear that if they don't rig our democracy, they will not win. Today, Democrats are standing up for a multiracial democracy. And then, of course, comes the originalism argument, always a predictable fallback for Republicans who, of course, are very concerned with the strict interpretation of the Constitution, which is why they incited a coup against the Capitol on January 6th. They'll introduce the idea that the framers, the founders, didn't want D.C. to become a state. And so while it's easy to hide behind the framers in 2023 by pretending that we knew what their intentions were 250 years ago, we also have the benefit of being able to just Read the Constitution. Article 1 says that the seat of government of the United States must not exceed 10 square miles. In other words, it doesn't say where the capital will be nor how big it should be, just that it'll be the seat of government and that it can't exceed 10 square miles. In other words, Republicans are right that the founders did intend for the seat of government to remain a federal district, but that doesn't mean that the area around it that comprises almost the entirety of Washington, D.C. can't be, meaning everything other than the Capitol, the White House, the Supreme Court, and most federal buildings. That's all that the seat of government is. In in other words, as far as the founders are concerned, statehood for Washington, D.C. is clearly constitutional. And beyond that, if you're really going to throw around the framers, I'm not exactly sure how that reconciles with the whole concept of taxation without representation. Pretty sure the founders, of all people, had some pretty strong feelings about taxation without representation. Unless, of course, Republicans want to conveniently leave that part out while channeling James Madison here. And one more note on the framers. Our entire system is built to allow for change. The Constitution allows for amendments and has them. We have a mechanism to add states and we have added states. The framers clearly knew that the Constitution would be a living, breathing document and that the country would grow and evolve. And the language in the Constitution bears that out. And Republicans generally seem to like that, considering a single day doesn't go by where they're not falling over themselves screaming about the Second Amendment. Although I guess the only changes to the Constitution that count are the ones that are convenient for Republicans. And finally, here's the argument that Republicans most like to surface. That D.C. statehood is a democratic power grab. As if history started today. As if we're not sitting in a country composed of states that were added for that express purpose of bolstering Republicans' numbers in the Senate. Heather Cox Richardson wrote a piece in The Atlantic a couple of years back and explained that, quote, in 1889 and 1890, Congress added North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Washington, Idaho, and Wyoming, the largest admission of states since the original 13. This addition of 12 new senators and 18 new electors to the Electoral College was a deliberate strategy of late 19th century Republicans after their swing toward big business cost them a popular majority. The strategy paid dividends deep into the future. Indeed, the admission of so many rural states back then helps to explain GOP control of the Senate today, 130 years later. And there's, of course, the fact that the Dakotas were split into two states for the express purpose of squeezing four senators out instead of two. And in case there was any doubt, it turns out that there were political implications taken into account. One of the most vocal supporters of the two Dakotas in the late 1800s was a Republican senator from Indiana who would later become the 23rd president, Benjamin Harrison, as if the benefits of adding two Republican states instead of one escaped a Republican president. And look, none of this is to say that both parties don't support or oppose whatever's good or bad for them at the time. But the simple fact is that historically speaking, Republicans actually made the argument for statehood already. And they continue to benefit from that argument to this very day. Admitting DC is not only constitutional, not only reasonable in terms of population size, but the GOP quite literally did the same thing themselves when it suited them. Not that Republicans have ever been swayed by their own words or actions in the past, but if they're gonna make those arguments, we should at least be able to reflect back to them their own own stance on it. And none of this, by the way, is to say that D.C. statehood wouldn't benefit Democrats because it clearly would, but for Republicans to be the ones pointing to that is either historical ignorance or shameless hypocrisy or some combination of the two. The fact is that Republicans have benefited from a system for over a hundred years wherein they're able to wield outsized power despite the fact that Senate Republicans consistently and constantly represent millions fewer Americans than Senate Democrats. The inherent advantage that Republicans enjoy couldn't be more obvious, but at the end of the day, what you can't justify is denying almost 700,000 Americans their right to representation in our federal government. 
Before you go, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. You can click the thumbnail right here on this screen. And if you want to support my work even further, the best way is to subscribe to my podcast, No Lie with Brian Tyler Cohen. There you can check out my interviews with major players in the world of politics, including President Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, Pete Buttigieg, Elizabeth Warren, Katie Porter, Jamie Raskin, and so many more. Plus other interviews that live exclusively on the podcast. That link is also right here on this screen, or just search No Lie with Brian Tyler Cohen wherever you listen to podcasts.